joined by one of my favorite people. Should I say that in real life? I mean, is that going to go to his head? <laughs> anyway, um, my brother, who's an amazing author, uh, is on his third novel. And it just came out, of course, the day that the shelter in place started in most of the country. Um, so like everyone else, he is doing his book tour online. And we wanted him to come on, even though we mostly... Uh, talk to musicians. It would be fun to talk to uh, uh, an author and, um, you know, get another artistic perspective on art and what's going on in the world right now. So I'm going to see. Oh, and he just figured out how social media works. Well, not really. Yeah, yeah pretty much. So we're going to see if he can figure I'm out. Just making a little coffee here. That's all. How to join us. And uh, we're going to bring him in now. So let's see how smart my bro is. Well, we know he's smart. I mean, he's smart, but, you That's know. How technologically. Book smart, book smart. Hang on a sec. Here he comes. Hey. We depend on him being book smart. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not book smart, then what are we doing? Hey, honey, how's your coffee going? My coffee. Uh, shit. Sh hey! hey! There he is. There's my bro. I did it. Oh, you did you it. Sure I'm did. so proud of you. There I am. Yeah. What's so, up, brother? Uh, uh, nothing. I mean, b before we start anything, I, you know, I, we just got to back up a second. What's this one of my favorite people thing? <laughs> well, Doug comes first. No, okay. I, I, I think right. it's arguable. So, so when you say one of my favorite people, you mean one of my two favorite people. <laughs> it depends Georgie. what day. Georgie, so that's three. That's Top three. three. If I'm in the top three, we're good. Actually, yes. Georgie, Absolutely. not so much my favorite person right now. <laughs> so you, you have Trump You're Easily, her. easily in the top three. Anyway, yeah. what, what are you drinking this morning? Oh, well, I'm drinking coffee. Mm. Did you make it? Did you grind it? Can I see inside? Uh, I don't know if you can see inside. I, I'm, I'm worried about tilting this tablet. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Uh, yeah, it's, I it's made in it. there. Actually, actually, Wahini ground the beans in our burr grinder that uh, Doug recommended to us many, many a year ago. Wow. Uh, right. But I, but I'm ashamed to say that the coffee itself was made in, you know, in just your regular Crips drip maker. Nothing. Yeah, I know. I know. And Dude, I don't, know, I don't know, think, I think we got to end this little. Anything. Not bougie enough. We got to end this segment. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Yeah. Well, I mean, see, in our house, in our house, the requirement is that you be able to actually make the coffee with your eyes closed in 15 <laughs> seconds or less. <laughs> you know, Doug, with all due respect, I love your coffee makers, but they, do, they don't even come close to that requirement. You're right, you're absolutely right. You need, like a, you need like a PhD in engineering. I have no idea how to make coffee, so I depend on Doug for my coffee needs. Why doesn't that surprise me? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, my mother-in-law used to say I was the smartest person she knew because I, I don't know how to cook, I don't know how to clean, I don't know how to make coffee. And she was like, wow, I wish I didn't know how to do those things when I got married. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think she definitely had a point. Yeah, mm -hmm. after your father, Alyssa. <laughs> yes, I'm sure he's watching right now. Very true. I hope so. I, hope I don't know. I don't think he knows how to do he's a lot of things. He's still struggling. He's still trying to get on the on the gram here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's some like there's some like user manual for grown up life that that got lost in the mail before it got to his mailbox. But uh, I'm pretty sure everybody. I, I was actually going to do an Instagram live on this. I'm pretty sure most people out there know what it's like to try to explain how to use Facebook or Instagram to their parents. Like they, I mean. But do they know how to explain it for the 11th time? If that's what <laughs> that's, I'm saying. That's the yeah. No, I'm saying every person goes through this. And I think like, I think it's just like an epidemic. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think, that, I think that whatever. True, like, bad word, you know, bad word. Whatever like Verizon or Apple Store executives or whatever got the bright idea of like, oh, let's sell iPhones, at, you know, to senior citizens tell them it's a great way to keep in touch with their families, right? <laughs> you know, they should be executed. Because it's like, you know, I mean, every day, it's like fielding a call from like, you know, one of our parents or one of our in-laws, like, how do you do this again? Like, why did you buy the phone? But the best, <laughs> totally. the best is when they like want to message you privately and they message you publicly. And it's like. <laughs> I haven't been there yeah. yet. Uh, it's uh, not fun, it's not fun. But by the way, did you, did you see that I'm representing? 
today. My man, hey. nice. That's good. Go. So love hey, it. look, here's the new shirt. One new of the shirt. new we'll shirts. We'll get you a new one. We'll get you a new oh, one. Sweet. sweet. Yeah, that's that's only one of the new ones. But yeah, I'll take I'll take three of them. <laughs> uh, and where's your um, where's your gringa shirt? I don't have a gringa shirt, but I have a special gringa copy. Hello. Oh, you do. Yeah. The, so the I, I went on. I went the on. The unedited and unproofread copy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, this is gonna be worth a lot more. But I went on Instagram yeah. Live a few or stories a few minutes ago to tell people we were gonna be here, and I said because of COVID, I have not received my copy, my hard copy in the mail. And that my brother was gonna be very mad at me for showing the galley copy, but you'll you'll accept this, right? I'll, I'll, I'll accept. I'll also remind you about Parnassus Books, fantastic independent bookstore, just about two miles from your house in Nashville. Nothing's open. They're delivering. I Wait, mean, they're Parnass mailed. really? They're, Good. Yeah, actually, actually, you should be getting a package from them in the next couple of days. I would think. Oh, fantastic. so they're carrying the book. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. uh, I th well, I don't know if they're carrying the book. I mean, but I hope they're carrying the book. They can always. But they, can they order it. Order. I mean, online orders in that way are are simpler than regular orders. The problem is, like you know, I I had uh, I was supposed to go on the road and do like fifteen events, and bookstores would order thirty, forty copies, right? Um, and then had to cancel the event, and so there are forty copies of my beautiful book sitting on their new book table just inside the door that nobody. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you but, can. Yeah, go ahead. You can get the book uh, online too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Amazon, Goodreads. There's a fantastic new um, website called bookshop.org. And what's, what's great about them is it's just as easy to use as Amazon. You just type the name in and you hit order. Um, but, in that, but in the case of bookshop.org, local and independent bookstores get a cut of the sale. So it's, so, you know, it's not the Amazon model where yeah. they're cutting bookstores and publishers out of it almost entirely. So I've been recommending people get the book on, on bookshop.org. It's great. It's a great I have shop. to say Dot what's okay, great for enough. like people good like tip. your moron sister. Uh -huh. Does anybody see how big this book is? Uh -huh. Anyway, I saw that it's an audio book too, in case you have to do a lot of things and you fall asleep every time you sit down after having a kid to read, you can get it on audiobook. Is that not true? That is true. It was narrated by this actor named Kurt Bonham. And I just heard because of, you know, because of all the COVID disruptions, I haven't even received my author copy of it. But but the, the, the guy who narrated it, this actor named Kurt Bonham, um, posted like a, like a two minute just teaser um, on Facebook that I got to listen to. And he sounds great. I mean, it's really wild to sort of hear somebody else's voice telling your story. Um, but I kind of loved it. So for, cool. you know, for people with short attention spans or who like to you know listen to books while they're jogging or something like that? Yeah, you can you can order the audio book and and here just you know just so you know like the the actual finished copy of the there book you go. look that different. Yeah, than, but it's, uh, it looks it's great. The copy that uh, that Alyssa and Doug have. You yeah, see, when we were growing up, Andrew was like the star student, and I was like you know the rug rat kind of like whatever. If you were a rug rat and he was a star student, I was the rug. <laughs> oh yes, the three of us all grew so up together. She was together. crawling all over you. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Well, eventually. <laughs> the three of us grew up together. For those of you who don't know the ground story, millions of times now, we grew up together. Andrew actually and Doug were in a band together and on Little League together. Odyssey forever. <laughs> Odyssey. That's right. And that's our first how band. We, that's how we met. And uh, so we've all, you know, we're kids like us together. Oh yeah, that's us. See, there's our new record. Vinyl, yeah, kids yeah, like us. We'll talk about that later. But so we go way, way back, all way three back. of us, not just my brother and me, me and my brother. Correct me. Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> we we would we could use some correction here. Yeah, Andrew. I, I stopped listening for a second. So <laughs> I'm glad you're wearing your your Graham shirt instead of the the shirt I sent you, which says I'm silently correcting your grammar. Which <laughs> oh yeah, but yeah, I give that to Wahini. She sleeps in it. <laughs> Good. That must be nice to wake up to. <laughs> anyway, tell us about yeah, tell your us. third novel, which just got rave reviews in the LA Times and the London Times. And, um, and you know, this is my favorite one yet. I'm, I'm only about halfway through, but 
I tried right. to use smaller words in this one. You, yes, you did. And I didn't have to read it with a dictionary. <laughs> so I'm excited. Well, that was only the first one, but that I was mean, also that, an amazing book. It, but one of the things I love about all your books is that for me, I, I really like historical fiction. And there's a lot of historical fiction in Lady Lazarus. Your first, first book is loosely based on rock and roll. Rock and roll legends i mean we yeah, one poetry, could punk rock and suicide that's what that yeah was. that's right that and, was great and this okay. one is loosely based on the story of laurie Varenson, which if people don't know who that tell. is i'm going to and that's why i'm setting it up i'm setting it up <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the book yeah okay um so uh as you guys know uh, because you visited me there i lived in peru in the late 90s for a couple of years um i was just a sort of <clears throat> you know, kicking around sort of privileged American gringo with enough savings to sort of, you know, to live in South America for a couple of years. Um, it was, it was, a, you know, it was a weird time in my life, but it was also a really amazing time in my life. I got to know that country really well um, and the people and I learned Spanish, you know, reasonably well. Um, the two of you visited me there, it was great. We hiked the Inca Trail, we saw Machu Picchu, we did a lot of great stuff. We caught the same, you know, uh, communicable foodborne illnesses. It was, it was awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that was going on in that country at the time, um, or had recently happened, was that there was this American woman, um, uh, f originally from New York, who had dropped out of MIT in the late 80s and had spent a couple of years in El Salvador during the end of their civil war in the early 90s. And then she sort of wound up in Peru in the mid 90s. And next thing anybody heard of her, she was arrested um, by like counterterrorism forces. She was renting this house in the suburbs um, and there were like 12 members of a, of a leftist militant group there. The government said that they were planning to attack the Congress building and, and abduct legislators and force like hostage exchanges. And this whole thing was against the backdrop of this hor horrific 12 year dirty war that the country had recently fought against a Maoist uh, insurgency called the Shining Path. 70,000 people had been killed. And so nobody in Peru was in any mood to put up with, you know, this white girl from the US kind of interfering, maybe trying to stir up revolution again. I mean, she denied that she had any part in this. And it's really not clear what part, if any, she actually had. Mm -hmm. But she was eventually convicted in a military court and sentenced to life in, pr in a military prison like 12,000 feet above sea level. It was, you know, it was, it was kind of a minor international scandal in the late 90s. Like Jesse Jackson went to Lima and Bill Richardson and, you know, the Clinton administration was like working all these back channels to get her released and, and they, and they failed. She stayed in, in prison until 2010 when she was paroled and she eventually left Peru in 2015. Anyway, so the gringa is sort of like, it's a, it's inspired by that story, but it's not, it doesn't claim to tell any kind of true story about what happened there. It was just my attempt to sort of imagine what might have really happened. Because frankly, like, I don't believe the government's story. And I don't entirely believe her story. And I there was the truth somewhere in between, but nobody's ever really gotten to it. So I'm not a journalist, I'm a novelist. So I tried to write a novel that would think about, you know, not only what happened, but but what it means, you know, for Americans to go gallivanting around the world saying like, hey, we want to join the movement. We want to, hmm. you know, we're, we're here to help, right? I mean, like, yeah. what, what could be more terrifying to someone who lives in the developing world than an American showing up saying, I'm here to help, right? I mean, it never really works out that way. Which is so. what all us like starry eyed sort of liberal college kids at the time, even now, thought we could, you know, think we can do, although none of us really took it to that extent and actually tried to do something maybe whatever way she was trying to do it we obviously we don't know but still you know i think all of us had that starry-eyed vision of like we want to save the world and help right. the movements and whatever right and right and 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 coming from the united states like you can you can have those thoughts you can march in the street you can write your editorials or whatever and there's not very much at stake i mean nobody's going to come kick in your door and throw you in a military prison and americans like really don't understand how lucky we had it that that's the case. And, you know, you get an idea in your head of like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to go to this other country and sort of, you know, try to have solidarity with the people or whatever. And it's a lot more dangerous and not only to you, right? I mean, to the, to the people of that country. And so 
that's a lot of what the book's about. I mean, the, 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 the narrating character of the story um, is another American who's just coming to terms with exactly this question. He's living down there as an expat, kind of, kind of like I did, just having a good time, not contributing anything to Peru. I mean, just sort of, you know, gratifying himself. And in the course of like trying to write this character's story, he comes to see like, you know, basically what an irresponsible parasite he's been and how sort of thoughtless towards this country that he claims to love, that he claims to mm. want to help in the same way that she did. So, you know, that's, it's, 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 it's a comedy. It's, it's a rom, it's a rom-com, you know, it's. <laughs> Light. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's summer not a, reading, a read, but um, you know, like you said, the London times did call it a, a thriller. <laughs> Um, so I guess, I guess that's good. I guess it's a page turner. I think it's a page yeah. turner. I mean, like I said, I love historical fiction. And for me, when I can kind of like, I remembered that story, obviously I, I, you know, remember living through that time. And so yeah. that's helpful to me as a reader reading a book that's fiction, but based on something that, you know, is factual and that I remember. So we, we were talking about Lori uh, Berenson when we were down visiting you in Peru, I remember. Right. And we, I remember being confused, thinking she was part of the Shining Path, and you were like, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure she's on her own at the time, and this was a long time ago, you know? Yeah. And we yeah. were like, oh, really? We didn't know anything about it, you know? We right. couldn't decipher right. the difference. And, and, but that's, but that's, the, that's exactly the mix-up that was unavoidable, right? I mean, she, the, the people she was living with were part of this other group that, you know, still, th this, was a, this was a violent um, revolutionary group, but they weren't. I mean, the Shining Path was really like a sadistic personality cult. Um, this other group called the Tupac Amaro Movement, they, they weren't that. But, but after 12 years and 70,000 dead bodies, nobody in Peru was interested in making that distinction, right? Yeah, right. If you were saying you were a leftist re revolutionary in Peru in the 90s. You were Sendero. You were, you were part of the Shining Path. And like arguing like, oh, my group's not as violent as right. that. No, nobody cares. Right. Yeah. And and it was constantly in the news, even after she was convicted and in prison, she, um, you know, there would be motions to for a new trial or whatever. And every time she would go back into the news and, and you know, there would just be this outpouring of vitriol from from all quarters. I mean, she got death threats. Her lawyers got death threats. The diplomats got death threats. Eventually, she had a, a child in prison. And when they were paroled and living in Lima, just the two of them, the child was getting death threats. I mean, you know, she was really, really hated in wow. that country. Um, and something about the force of that hatred also really, really intrigued me and really confused me. And I wanted to try to understand it with this book. W were there any other characters in real life that you drew from or any other circumstances that were, you know, relevant to the fiction? So, so that's a trickier question. That's such a good question, question, honey. That's a great question. Um, I, I mean, you know, all the historical figures, right? The, the president of Peru, President Clinton, um, you know, the Abimeo Guzman, who was the founder of The Shining Path, you know, they're referred to in the novel in, in, in essentially factual historical oh. way. The people who are like, you know, central characters who are around, um, the, the, in, in my book, the, the, the woman's name is Leonora, and, and the people she's around, the people she's living with, they're they're all fictional characters, but they're also sort of composites. I mean, they're based on um, what I know of the history, and also like the hundreds of hours of interviews I did in Peru. You know, over the course of the eight years I was writing this book, and I interviewed journalists, and I interviewed former militants, and I interviewed former soldiers, and I interviewed sort of um, student organizers and people who'd been active on on the university campuses during this time, and really tried to get a sense of what the experience of this war was um, uh, from, from, from as many inside perspectives as I could. I mean, because this was a war, like nobody, nobody was not touched by it. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, if you lived in, in Lima or you lived in the provinces, if you spoke Spanish or you spoke English or you spoke Quechua. I mean, life for 12 years in Peru, and especially the last two years of the war, frankly, was not completely unlike what we're living now with coronavirus. I mean, it was, you know, it was suspended animation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there were car bombings, there were kidnappings in, 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 in the light of day on the streets of Lima, mm -hmm. there were military checkpoints at every corner, there were curfews, you couldn't leave your house, you didn't send your kids outside. 
um, you know, Lima was turned into a war zone in the last couple of years. And so, you know, I talked to as many people as I could who lived through that and had totally different perspectives on it and sort of tried to mash a lot of them up into different fictional characters without claiming to, to right, tell anybody's course. story, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Because it makes me think about like someone like Bo Bergal, you know, who's like just just the latter half maybe of her life where they're fighting to get out of prison, you know, right. maybe it's where it's most relevant, but. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, writing historical stuff, like it's hard enough, I imagine, when you're writing about stuff, you know, 50 or 100 years ago and most of the people you're fictionalizing have died and there's sort of less at stake at, a, at an ethical level about yeah. fictionalizing the story, you know? But a lot of people who are who factor into this story are still alive, and it felt, you know, I felt like I had to be really careful and responsible towards them. For, yeah. Most of all, towards Peruvians who'd actually lived through this, because I because I didn't, you know. So who am I to tell the story? So I had to yeah. really make sure I was doing it in a smart and responsible way. I during reading the book, I've been watching periodically interviews with Laurie Berenson, and it's just interesting to see her now. Oh yeah, uh, you know, and her perspective on what what she went through and what she was doing down there at the time versus how she's looking at it now as an adult who spent how many years, 20 years? 15 years in prison and another five on parole where she couldn't leave the country. I wonder what she would think of the book. I don't know. And, and it's interesting that like I, I have deliberately not watched a lot of footage with her because I, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't trying to tell her story. I don't have right. any record her story. I don't know anything more about her story than you can read in the newspapers. And so I felt like if I watched too much of her, it was going to bleed over into what I was writing. So, you know, yeah. I'm interested to hear you to talk about kind of how, how she how she talks about that stuff. I don't know what she would think of the book. I mean, if I were in her shoes, I probably wouldn't be that happy about the book. <laughs> it would probably be hard to read it without feeling like, you know, that's not true. That's not what I thought. That's not what I felt. Yeah, but <laughs> which, right. which, which is why, you know, I wanted to make it absolutely clear. This isn't a true story. Of course. It's not based on her. It's, you know, it takes the general outlines of what happened and tries to write a fictional story about it. Yeah, that's cool. So um, we told everyone that we were going to do some reading and do some music and whatever. And so... You I, wanna... like, I like both those things, but I can't play music to save my life. <laughs> that's know? not true. Bullshit! <laughs> you started an Odyssey, man. The band yeah. Odyssey. My Come brother's on. an amazing singer and guitar player. For all you literary people out there but who know him know. just as you'll an author, never know. he's an amazing singer. Hey, he used to sing like Genesis songs and what else? Like all kinds of great songs. Yeah, Pink Floyd and whatever. And then he stopped because you know he couldn't compete with me. So <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at do you want to? You yeah. want to do a, a reading from the book and then we'll play a song, maybe? I do, but first we have a special guest who. Oh my goodness! Who is on television? With a special is that my message. We have, Hi, here, buddy. we have a special message for Cubby's aunt. What's that? What is it, Bert? Happy birthday uh. to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Alyssa. Yay! Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Yay. I love you, Cup Cup. Yes. Yes. Two days. My birthday's not today to everybody, but this is a good, this is my nephew wanted to sing today, so that's perfect. But you know what, Cub? You're going to have to sing again in two days. Promise? Pink Floyd, buddy. Pink yeah. Floyd! Who got you that Great. shirt? Uh, yeah, who got you this shirt? Do you remember? I uh, did. Alyssa I and did. Alyssa did. Yeah. I yeah. love you, boo. You want us to play a song first so you can watch? Yeah. Okay, let's play a song. Yeah, I'm gonna get the guitar. Oh, boy, I, I thought you were going to read first. Well, <laughs> How did that happen? You had your vocal scales today, Doug? Exactly. So, <laughs> morning time singing is always a blast. Not that this song really has anything. You know, I watched this thing once a while ago with this author who shall rename, remain nameless because I don't even know his name, but he did an exchange like this with this artist, uh, Rachel Yamagata, who I'm a fan of. Uh -huh. And... Uh, you know, they kind of swapped like readings and then rel 
you know, songs that kind of related to the reading, which oh, yeah. we can't necessarily do. However, you don't have any songs about violent revolution. Exactly. <laughs> However, we do. We do have a song, the title track of our record that we wrote, um, not that similar to the character Leonardo, Leo, Leo Leonora. in your Leonora. book, but basically, you know, two kids who like wanted to, who were fed up with America and wanted to yeah. escape in some way. Yeah. So this is, and since we all grew up together, this is a song called Kids Like Us. Awesome. All right. Song. Title track of the new CD. Ha ha ha. We'll get back to the story, the reading, the real substance real soon here. <laughs> Music's right, ready. Yeah. We'll try. We'll try this on acoustic guitars. Oh. <laughs> Uh, 
somewhat what your character felt like when she wanted to get out of America. Probably. Cubby says, happy birthday, at the Thank you, boo-boo. I love you so much. Homeschool. Look, you can see. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we got more coming right at you right now. Right now. We're going to read some from the Gringa. The oh, new you are? By author Andrew Alchol. You can read it if you want, Alyssa. You definitely don't want me to. <laughs> Maybe I should have done the audio, but. Um, yeah, so, right, this is kind of um, more or less the opening of the Gringa, a little, a little bit, um, a little bit uh, edited to make it, uh, to make it sort of go a little more quickly for, uh, for Instagram Live. But, um, but the, the book just starts out with um, a scene a couple of days after this character <laughs> has been arrested uh, by special forces. Um, and the law in Peru at the time, which um, was arguably a violation of the Geneva Conventions, was um, that when they took uh, prisoners um, in a counterterrorism offensive, they did what they called a press presentation, which was essentially like a perp walk, um, which, is, which violates international law. Um, but in any case, uh, in real life, this presentation was, was a disaster for Lori Berenson because she, she seemed angry, um, she was sort of like berating um, the press who were there and she just sort of, uh, she just kind of ful fulfilled the government's portrayal of her as this like violent radical. Um, and it, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of sealed her fate. Um, so the beginning of the novel reimagines that scene. And then the rest of the novel, like I said, is this, is this expat character trying to figure out what the hell happened to get her there in the first place. So it's right from the beginning of the Gringa. The 1998 press conference was the first time most Peruvians had seen Leonora Gelb, eight hectic minutes in which her fate was all but sealed. Raw-eyed, hoarse, she marched into the room without an introduction, turning upon the reporters her battered, vengeful gaze. The real danger to Peruvians is not the Cuarta Filosofia, it's their own government, she shouted. The worst violence in this country is state violence. Ask the campesinos whose land was stolen, whose children are dying. Ask the people whose brothers and husbands have disappeared. It was a Tuesday morning, the ragged end of a restive, clammy winter. The basement room stank of shoe polish and spilled coffee. Three days earlier, the house she was renting in the leafy Pueblo Libre neighborhood had been sacked by special forces, ravaged, its windows blown out, its white walls strafed. They dragged the bodies of six militants from that house, flaunted them to reporters while the president walked through the wreckage and shook soldiers' hands. A demon, he'd called her, flapping her passport at the TV camera. A psychopath, a gringa. For three days, she'd been locked away while the press stoked public fury. Now she stood surrounded by nervous soldiers, their rifles at the ready, as if to sell her, to sell the idea of her. Someone who required such precautions must be dangerous indeed. But the demon was doll-sized, something farcical about her wild, wiry hair, her wet pants. In her powder blue sweatshirt and granny glasses, she looked more like a third grade teacher than a murderous subversive. They couldn't match this figure to the footage the whole country had seen, the burning house, the smashed gate, smoke whirling up into searchlights like a vision of apocalypse. They didn't see a monster until she opened her mouth to speak. No one can deny the terrible inequality, she said. No one can deny the racism and exploitation that keep millions in poverty while a tiny group enriches itself. This country was founded on violence, built on violence. The wealthy protect their privilege. Just shut up already, someone called out. There was low laughter, a ripple in the crowd. They could see steam on her glasses, a stain creeping down her thighs. Why were there guns in the house, Leo? Another voice called, and then a deluge. Who stole the military uniforms? Leo, why did you have blueprints of, co of Congress? Were you working with the Cubans? Leo, is this justice, Leo cried? Is it democracy? Leo, were you the girlfriend of Augustine Duenas? Leo, do you work for the CIA? Are you a terrorist, Leo? At this, she pulled up, blinking. The room took a breath. Leonora, are you a terrorist? Her eyes scanned the back wall as though looking for a familiar face. The question came again and she licked her lips, a whole country waiting for her answer. Years later, in the forsaken silence of her prison cell, she would still lie awake, contemplating a word. She would turn it over in her mind, try to understand its nature, to find her reflection in its empty depths. Was she or was she not a terrorist? 
In these pages, I've tried to sort through the evidence to determine what she wanted, what she might have felt. From disparate fragments and glaring absences, I've tried to build a coherent narrative, one that does justice to the history and its many victims. I've tried to keep my own feelings out of it. I've tried to consider all sides. But it's been more than a decade. The words terror, freedom, democracy, war, they don't mean the same things anymore. Leo, the reporters shouted. Her hesitation had made them predatory. Answer the question. A man stood on a chair and yelled, fuck you, Leo, and fuck the philosophers. How many of them did you have sex with, Leo? Leo, why did you come to this country? Why do you want to kill Peruvians? How are they treating you in jail, Leo? Have you been raped? The soldiers moved to quiet them. Leo's breath came heavily, a shadow of alarm playing across her face. Everyone waited. Just as it seemed there would be no answer, the prisoner cleared her throat. The Quarta Filosofia is not a terrorist organization, she said. The sudden crush caught the soldiers off guard. Tape rolling, flashes exploding. Leo, they called out, Leo! Is it terrorism to love freedom, she said? Is it terrorism to hate injustice, to feed people who are hungry? She lifted her broken arm as far as she could, her hand white and clammy and clenched with effort. And when I watch the clip, I see her trying to quiet the crowd, to finish what she wanted to say. But the press told a different story, repeated it until it became its own truth. La Leo raised her fist in defiance. She made a gesture of militant solidarity. She dug her own grave. There are no terrorists in the Quarta Filosofia, she said. It's a revolutionary movement fighting to improve the lives of people who've been forgotten. She craned her neck, her voice cracking. If it's terrorism to help poor mothers and sick children, then I'm a terrorist. If it's a crime to stand for workers and the oppressed, I accept whatever punishment I'm given. And there it was, the red meat, the money shot. Every newspaper in Peru ran the photo the next morning, the hysterical savage, the white girl brandishing her fist and the identical headline, Yo Soy Terrorista. It was a disaster, a kind of suicide. Her captors could not believe their ears. Five days later, Leonora Geld was sentenced to life in prison for treason and leadership of a terrorist group. The prosecutor stood before the judges in their canvas hoods and shrugged. The matter was out of his hands. Senores, he said, the prisoner has already confessed. <laughs> awesome, man. This is the beginning yeah. of the book because I. It's the beginning. Yeah, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I mean it's that's, you know, reading the beginning awesome, of a book man. like that is super gripping, and you know it drew me right in. Even, even when you're reading it now, like it started off like cool reading on the internet. This is interesting. Okay, let's see. And then by the end, I'm like, wait, don't stop, don't stop. Uh, well, that's nice. I feel like you know everybody, just... everybody who's watching their day just took a turn towards the dark. Can, can no, just, I don't think so. Can you just story time for Doug every I need story night? time. Sure, sure. Story you can, time you can just tune in while Cubby and I read Winnie the Pooh for the 11th time. <laughs> yeah, right. So the, the, Winnie the, the Pooh is a lot better than if I were an owl. Yeah, I'd have scratchy feet. Oh, sure. We never had the owl. We had if I were a puppy. We had if I were a bunny. A bunny, too. We have that, too. We have that, too. <laughs> we had one other. I can't remember what it was. but uh... So just to clarify again, I know owl, we touched uh... on this, but the narrator in the book, yeah. the journalist, yeah. is Andreas. Andres, yeah. And he's not you. He's but not me. But again, loosely based on your experience in Peru. I mean, sort of, you know, it's more, it's more based on like how I look back now as, as a more mature and, and, and thoughtful person on my experience in Peru. You know, I mean, w w the, the way I think of it now is like, I got a hell of a lot more out of my time in Peru than Peru got out of my being there. You know, I mean, I was, sure. I was there for myself. I wasn't there for anybody else. And I was there because I, you know, because I'm a privileged white American who can do that kind of thing, who, who can afford to, you know, reinvent myself or whatever it is that we call it. And most people in the world don't, don't have that ability. Right. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I behaved badly when I was there, but the whole question of like, you know, what does it mean for someone to come down to your country and reinvent themselves and to sort of use the country as a, as a sort of backdrop for their own, you know, whatever spiritual journey or whatever you want to call it. Like there's something pretty icky about it. And like, so the character of Andres is, um, you know, he's someone who the book understands this about him in a way that I didn't understand about myself at the time. And so it kind of exaggerates a little bit his, his irresponsibility. I mean, he's, he's knocked up his girlfriend. And so one of the reasons 
that his Peruvian girlfriend. Spoiler alert! Well, you know, it's not really the main plot point. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, he's, he sort of has to be forced to tell this story because he's, he's also moved, unlike me, he's moved down to Peru um, in the mid 2000s. And, and so he calls himself a refugee from George W. Bush's America. He just wants out. He wants to get away from post 9-11, Patriot Act, Abu Ghraib, invasion of Iraq, like he's just disgusted and, you know, he wants out. Um, and so he, and he wants to just forget about politics as if, as if anybody really has the luxury of right. forgetting about politics. And so when this uh, website comes to him and says, you know, we want you to profile Leonora Gelb, he says, no freaking way, you know, uh, but he's running out of money. Uh, his girlfriend's pregnant and he's way too irresponsible to try to, you know, step up. And so he takes off from the, from the city he's living in and just goes to Lima and, and dives into this story. Um, yeah. And in the process of telling it, he, he kind of figures out, you know, he, he sees himself in exactly the light that I now kind of see myself from, from 20 some odd years ago. Interesting. So you learn about yourself writing this book probably. No, well, I mean, sort of like, you know, any, anybody, anybody who writes a novel learns about themselves, even if even if there's not someone who's supposed to look like them in the book. I mean, a novel is this very strange kind of kind of auto therapy in some ways. You just you figure out how your brain works and what you're preoccupied with. Um, it's, it's more like I finally got a, a chance to express some of the things that I've come to understand in the intervening 20 years and to try to. I mean, this maybe sounds a little grandiose, but but maybe try to give something back to Peru if it could only be the sort of respect and, and consideration of, of the trauma that country went through, you know, 20 years too late. I mean, I should have been able to give something to that country then, but this is the best I can do now. Oh, well, you know, great. we should be doing this like once a week with Andrew because I'm learning so much more about him than I learn when I'm with him in person. <laughs> you mean you don't you don't think about like yeah you know, like Latin American history and Latin American politics just on no, but I could kind of ask you yeah. anything right <laughs> yeah, now exactly. and you'd have to answer nicely. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. You know, uh, yeah, you know, that's really amazing. Ten people watching could learn a lot about you if you're not. Uh huh. Uh huh. You asked me but, if there were any stuff. What? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to hear a little bit more about kids like us because, you know, you guys are going through the same thing. You worked on this album for years. You had a big tour planned. Um, I mean, for, for a little bit later, but it turns out not to matter. I mean, you were going to be in Europe all summer. And so yeah. what's going on? I mean, it's the same as you, you know, it, it's yeah. a lot of people have it a lot worse. So we can't complain. You know, we have each other and we've been talking about we need to play more concerts online on the Internet because yeah. that's where the future is. And, and that's now, what people tell us we need to do. And maybe we thought maybe we can get there before everybody got there. But now everybody's there and we're trying to get okay. there. I mean, that, that's that's okay. Okay. I mean, on any given night in normal circumstances, there are a trillion bands playing in various venues. So you know, yeah. that's true. Out. And you know, it's yeah. an opportunity for us to reach people who couldn't come see us. And I mean, we were doing six yeah. weeks in Europe, and then presumably coming back here to tour. But like, you know, we think about it, the, the venues we play are like 200 to 50 people. And there, there's not if you put them all together, there's not that many people getting to see you at least the yeah. internet, you know, people all around the world. Come this is the new record. I just wanted to back up for a second, though. I found it. It's pretty interesting when you're talking about learning about yourself writing the book. It's it, when it, it, the songwriting is such a like a mini, mini, mini version of what you do in some ways. <laughs> And it, 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 one song, let's say, a whole album, Smaller maybe. Chunks. Yeah, sure. yeah, it's small little chunks of, you know, you're putting this stuff out there. And, you know, it's so funny. You, you listen to young artists and, and they. We write, are young artists. You know, like extremely young artists. And uh, <laughs> uh, your birthday is in two days. You, you, That's the you, one subject off limits. You listen to, you, listen to um, you know, a lot of artists and their songwriting is so exposing like they they almost it seems like they are writing it thinking they're being so mysterious and yet they're exposing <laughs> their personality so blatantly where yeah. you know whereas in, in, in novel writing there's so much more of a growth that has to take place as somebody who's in, a interpreting that reading right. and b right. as, as a writer to and sort the life of, of a character you, you almost longer. have the time to unfold and realize oh this is so much more like me whereas musicians put the record out you know, like two albums later, they listen to one of their old songs. And I'm like, oh, man, I really oh. told that straight up. 
<laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Know, one of the differences between like poets and prose writers, right? I mean, poets, yeah. not all of them, but but a lot of poets, like you know, it's it's just taken as a given that you write from personal experience, that you write to to in some ways. Um, find expression for really complicated emotions or experiences or, or ways of looking at the world. Um, I think that happens too with fiction writing, but it's masked in a way. And so when yeah. I when I call it like auto therapy, it's 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 more like more like auto psychoanalysis, right? Like yeah. like like you can especially once you've written uh, you know a couple of books, uh, you know, a, a dozen, two dozen short stories, what I'm talking about is like not the process of writing them, but the process of going back and, and looking at them and seeing what sort of comes up again and again, maybe changes shape or changes its face or, or its tone a little bit, but certain things, certain kind of dynamics that come up again and again in the stories. And you only notice them sort of after the fact. And then you say, huh, I didn't know that that was something that really meant a lot to me or that I was trying to work out or confused about, right. but it's all right there. I mean, it came from somewhere. Um, yeah. So yeah. That's always really fascinating to me. Well, yeah, I no, wonder, I, can, I can relate to that. It's really amazing. It's really I wonder amazing. if since, you know, particularly me and my brother, is that right? No. Me, it depends, and, finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if particularly me and my brother, but the three of us who grew up together and also Brian McCann who no, writes with brother. us. Yeah. Fuck. Of anyway, <laughs> I wonder if if somebody read three of your books and listened to three of our albums, if they'd see any sort of you know similarity in our history and where we came from and what sort of we've expressed and and themes that we go back to again and again. I wonder if there's any similarity. Yeah. Well, I think something like the song that you played, "Kids Like Us," you know, and then and then if someone reads my book, you know, they might say like, "Oh, okay," you know, I get I get a kind of like outlook here. I get a I get a personality, you know. True, but, it's so familiar. We should maybe do some kind of yeah. We should maybe do some kind of collaborative project, you know, a record and a book called like "Our Basement." <laughs> called like how our parents screwed us up that's how sort of us, every like, record or every book right made. right right this weekend's party our at the house exactly. jersey <laughs> suburbs yeah exactly right our, and just our, to fill it and just to fill in the history for people here yeah that you know i'm the i'm the older child and, obviously you know, frank frankly you know the favorite child um obviously and, uh, and uh you know i got away with a lot of shit when i was a kid including having a lot of keg parties in the basement of our house in the suburbs you didn't get away with it mom and dad bought the kegs <laughs> no they didn't buy the kegs but they were pretty lenient about it but uh anyway more or less uh this is how Alyssa met doug is when i failed to keep my my pest of a little sister from sneaking down into the parties and then you know <laughs> There's this, you know, handsome, not quite as bearded dude playing the guitar. Yeah. Uh, smoking a lot of weed. How, smoking a lot of weed. No. And that's how the Grams met. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So you're taking full credit, that's, basically. That's true. I, you know, I mean, I don't know Old what school. credit's the word I'm looking for, but yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh -huh. I'm just filling in the blanks. Hey, man, based on the, on the, like, you know, people who hung out at our house weekend after weekend, you, you lucked out. It could have been a lot worse. Oh, that is true. That is true. That is true. I, I have to even agree with that yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, I won't name names, but there's some people I think of that I could be married to that it would be a lot, you know, worse for our family. I, um, I can think of some names, but yeah, let's let's not. Let's not. Let's not. Uh, um, so speaking of, you know, you're talking about Andres who, who knocked up his girlfriend, which spo that spoiled it, the whole book the for whole me. Book. But so. Wait, didn't you say you're halfway through? We got like, <laughs> we got like, you know, I don't know, like 10, 12 minutes left. And, okay. and so let's play a song and do another yeah. reading. And okay. yeah. I'm going to play a song that started about um, Doug and I having sex in the back of my Honda. Oh, boy. The first time, right after we met in, in the basement through my big brother. That's so awesome. Thanks. That's not how it happened. <laughs> this is just being a shocker. Uh, but there is a line about something like that. No, the that's how the song started. But it ended being a song about, you know, this whole, like... Well, you decide. You tell us what it's about. I no, it's not. a song about getting back to love. Come on. Love this in the is back a song... What? Love in the back of a Honda. Love in the, love in the back <laughs> of a Honda. No, honestly, no. it started that way, but it ended about 
a song like we wrote the, the record while riding a motorcycle across the country during election season. And we were, we were very obviously distraught. <laughs> GG, this is a family show. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Garzy. Um, but, uh, you know, we ended up like having all this like anger and hatred as we were going across the country. And what we realized at the end of the journey was as cliche as it sounds is we're kind of running out of time for for love. We're running out of time for people to get back together. I and... No, no, no. <laughs> I decided we'd play this one because of the sure. getting knocked up thing, which I did not get knocked up at the time. There's a lot of single ooze. Are you doing okay there, Andrew? You doing okay there? Back to love, back to love, guys. Okay, sing your ooze, honey. It's Instagram live, usually, it's not the Philharmonic. Usually these uh, harmonies are backed up by multiple singers. Uh, I'll be singing some solo ooze. Just Garza, you sing too. Yeah. <laughs> two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> With my heart, a summer breeze brought me to my knees and fell apart. Where'd you go? I don't know. 
You got to flip it around. I was trying to send up some bubbles, but I'm not really good at this. Uh, the <laughs> nice. Hearts and bubbles. How do you do that? I don't even know. Well, you I, can I, put I, like little faces on there, I think, but I'm not going to mess with yeah, it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, That's great. That was great. Yeah. I, I feel bad for the guy who had to detail that Honda, but otherwise the song was awesome. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> No doubt. Uh, it was really quick, so you know. <laughs> yeah. There's no time. <laughs> no time for love. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> would you read another uh, another excerpt, and then uh, we can, yeah. uh, you know, bash our family a little more and say goodbye. Oh. oh, maybe we should skip the excerpt then if we get to bash. <laughs> the um, yeah, I'll just read something really quick because, like, you know, like I, like I said, the novel kind of flips back and forth between these two voices. You know, the 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 Leonora who's having the, this experience living in this house with the militants. And then 10 years later, Andres, who's trying to tell the story. Um, so here's a, here's a section from about halfway through, no spoilers in here. It's, it's more Andres kind of talking about himself and how he sees himself and, and how it is that he came to be an expat. So this section is just called Andres. And I'm just gonna read you know the first page or so of it. I was a nomad a stateless actor, a refugee from George W. Bush's America. A murka, he called it, flinty-eyed, squinting, a primitive place, a murka, where trespasses are never forgiven, where arguments are always settled with fisticuffs, a lost eye avenged at the blade of a knife, a lost tooth repaid with your whole fucking head. A murka, a place without history or memory, where it's always morning, and to dwell on what you might have done last night, drunk and staggering, smashing bottles, molesting the wenches, pissing on the floor, would be a show of weakness, an impediment to your doing it again. And so when the bartender comes looking for you, or the wench's father, what you do in America, what you do if you're a real American, is stand tall, double down, put up your dukes and spit right in the bastard's eye. Somos todos americanos, my friends in Babylonia used to say, we are all American, but American? That title is reserved for the kingdom's rightful heirs, they who fear God and love Brittany, who never met an assault rifle they didn't like, who hacked their way across a continent, murdering, cheating, infecting, and torturing the natives into submission, who imposed dominion upon a hemisphere, sucked its oil and gouged its gold, poisoned its aquifers, mined its harbors, assassinated its leaders, and redrew its maps. It was Americans who named the animals, Americans who split the atom, who won the Cold War by threatening to extinguish us all. Don't give me that nonsense about equality or fair play. Americans know cooperation is a sucker's game. It interferes with profits. We have no truck with treaties, no time for old world politesse. We take what we want by force or deception and woe unto your children's children if you dare ask for it back. What I'd once been, a novelist, a skeptic, a conscientious objector, hardly an American to begin with, that is, subject to constant suspicion, to bafflement and revulsion at my lack of a mortgage or a jumbo TV, barely tolerated, vanished to the margins. I stood outside the fence and watched the unending carnival, the bright pink neon, the clown grins and the whirl of heavy machinery. I listened to the shrieks of children, the haunting calliopes, smelled the treacle and the burning meat ever torn between horror and longing, disapproval and loneliness, and a clawing sense of failure. That's Andres. He's a pretty happy guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It really, it really does, though, paint uh, well-rounded sort of characters at, uh, in the book right now. I definitely have a good the understanding. Two main characters the two main are characters. fascinating. I, I'm totally good. fascinated by both. Good. I'm excited to read it for sure. Thanks. So we're going to put the link in the bio so okay. everybody can go check out Where to buy Andrew this Alchel awesome. and book. the Gringa. And yeah, you can go buy it at your local bookstores, uh, of course, but also online and audiobook for yeah. you morons. But I'll read it. I'll read it. But <laughs> for um, you morons. You know, I just wanted I'm to just... say that I don't think that you're a moron if you buy Thanks. the audiobook. No. That's not you what you think, say. You we're I think... all... You, I think, are a moron, but anybody else buying the audiobook, you're not a moron simply <laughs> That's right. the audiobook. You can buy any version of the book that you want. That's cool. That's cool. Um, so one last thing to touch on, because we haven't really talked about it, but you talked about it a little, but like, you know, what... We're coming. We're here. We're back. <laughs> well, yeah, but we got to get we're him waiting, back. We're, we're waiting for AF Alchel here. He's coming any second. <laughs>
Well, that was a very good question. There. <laughs> I think I think Instagram ends. I think it has an hour limit, maybe. Yeah. So just to wrap up, I'm yeah. just curious, like what you know, as an author who's coming out with their third novel during this crazy pandemic going on, you know, what what do you have to say to like people out there who are other artists who are experiencing the same thing? Like, what should everybody be trying to to do in this position? God, if I if I had a halfway decent answer for that, I would bottle it and make a lot of money. I mean, I, I, re I really don't know. I mean, I, I've talked to a lot of writers in the past few weeks, a lot of people with books who just, that just came out or were scheduled to come out in April and May. Uh, and it's really difficult. I mean, you know, Amazon has, has deprioritized books. Um, and that's wow. a major way that books are sold because they don't have any other essential goods to ship. Um, you know, the bookstores are closed, they're selling online, but it's, but it's, you can't go in and, and browse. And so everything is about getting the word out. But first of all, everybody's trying to get the word out. And second of all, like a lot of people are really paying attention to other things with good reason. So I don't know the answer to it. I mean, all, all I'll say is that, is that one kind of bright spot in all of this has been um, the, the, the sort of solidarity that, um, that artists have really, have really shown for each other. I mean, uh, I'm just speaking for writers, like a lot of us are like, um, you know, in, in online groups together and helping to promote each other's books, to get the word out, inviting each other to do, to do various kinds of online events. Um, you know, uh, uh, unlike, well, I mean, it's a little different with music. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit the same also, like you do so much of writing alone you know, sitting at your desk, you know, in your pajamas with a cup of coffee um, and and sort of not ne never really knowing exactly like what the rest of the world mm -hmm. thinks about what you're doing or how it fits in. And so to have writers now sort of have each other's back is, is, a, is you know, it, it really is a silver lining to all this kind of understanding that there is that that fellowship out there of people who understand and people who are trying to do this, this same really difficult thing. Has that been true with musicians? Yeah, I was going to say, it's sort absolutely. of this great equalizer. I mean, you have everybody from, you know, I mean, I saw, you know, Sean Colvin and John Doe and, uh, you know, e even bigger, like probably bigger artists out there. I'm sure like people like Taylor Swift too, are are doing this kind of thing and all the way down to, you know, people John like Doe. us, the, sure. what? John Doe is bigger than Taylor Swift in my book. Well, yes, no John Doe is awesome. <laughs> but, you know, I think that everybody's sort of, it's the great equalizer. Everybody's out there. And I do see, you know, artists who might have a record coming out the same day and might be competitive in another kind of era. Right now, they're helping to support each other because that's all, yeah. all we got. And that's great. That's what we should be doing. Right, yeah. And and one thing I'll add to that in in terms of books, and this probably applies to music as well is, um, you know, the, all the usual Amazon bashing aside, um, local bookstores are generally mom and pop businesses with a really, really small profit margin. In the best of times, it's a tough business. Mm -hmm. And this is not the best of times. And a lot of local bookstores are never going to reopen again because of how hard they're getting hit right now. So I just want to say, if you're buying the Gringa, if you're buying any books, over the next few months, please buy them from your local bookstore's website or buy them from bookshop.org. Um, that you know they're shipping just as fast as Amazon now. They're discounting just as much as Amazon is discounting right now. We can go back to the the, the convenience of Amazon when all this has passed. But right now, local bookstores really need your help. And if you're like me, like as soon as we can go outside again and walk around and go shopping or where. The, what's the first store you're going to walk into? It's going to be your bookstore and you want it to still be there. So That's please. Not true. Please. Same goes for, for small mom and pop local it's record not. stores. I mean, it's yeah. the same that they, they've been going by the wayside, you know, as much yeah. as small for, bookstores. Yeah. So yeah. go to your local record stores and support your, your local, local musicians as well. They're all working hard and your local writers. Don't the, forget. The link will be in the bio to go buy the book. Hold and up the your album, album. Uh, kids like us. Book. Here's the record. Yeah. <laughs> Brother and sister. And uh, next week, Bookshop. I think. Bookshop.org. Check that's it out. The one next week on Coffee with the Grams, I think we're going to have our friend Cody Dickinson from the North Mississippi All-Stars. So stay tuned for that every Tuesday. And Andrew, you're you, such Andrew. a good big brother. Yeah, that was yeah, awesome, buddy. I'm glad to finally hear you say that.
You're a pretty good sister. <laughs> Only too. on camera. <laughs> and a pretty good brother-in-law. Thank you both for having me on. Love so you, buddy. Love you. Love you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye.